So welcome to our lesson uh, today. We are going to look at sickle cell anemia and we can define sickle cell anemia as this is a severe chronic hereditary hemolytic disorder due to homozygous presence of hemoglobin S characterized by pallor, recurrent crisis and fatigue. So when it comes to sickle cell anemia, this is something which is chronic and it is a severe condition. And we are saying hereditary because this, for you to have sickle cell or to be called a sickler, you need to inherit both genes of, uh, of S hemoglobin. So in, in this condition, this individual needs to, to inherit the, 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 the what? Um, the sickle cell, uh, the sickle cell hemoglobin S, both of them from both parents. So, and this condition is basically mainly characterized by pallor or recurrent crisis or fatigue. So you realize that this patient is going to, uh, to, have, to be facing recurrent crisis. Uh, we have a lot of crises that we are going to discuss as we move on in this condition. So basically that's how you can define sickle cell anemia. The cardinal thing to remember is that for you to suffer from sickle cell anemia, you need to inherit both hemoglobin S cells, which are abnormal cells. Okay, so we can now move on to the types of hemoglobin. So for you to be able to understand better sickle cell, you need to understand it from the point of hemoglobin because it is this hemoglobin that it has a disturbance or that has a defective gene in it and it causes this condition that we are calling sickle cell anemia. So we have basically uh, two types of, uh, of hemoglobin. So the first hemoglobin that we, we have is HBA. So this is called adult hemoglobin and it is abbreviated as HBA, which is the normal hemoglobin that every individual should have in their blood system. This hemoglobin, it, co it is composed of two alpha and two beta chains. And this is the normal hemoglobin that yeah. everyone should have. Then the other type of hemoglobin that, that is there is fetohemoglobin. So fetohemoglobin is abbreviated as HBF, and this is fetohemoglobin. It is found in uh, children or newborn, and this one com it is composed of two alpha chain, two alpha chains, and two gamma chains. And like in the the adult one, the adult hemoglobin it has uh, two alpha and two beta chains. So we have uh, other other types of hemoglobin such as hemoglobin C, hemoglobin D and many others but these are the common two types of hemoglobin that each individual should have. Then we will move on now to the types of sickle cell disease. So the types of sickle cell disease will depend on the type of uh, sickle cell uh, trait or uh, sickle cell defective gene hemoglobin that is present uh, in this hemoglobin. So the, the, in terms of types of sickle cell disease, we are going to basically look at uh, three, even though there might be other types. So we'll start with the, what we call sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, which is going to be our main focus for today as a condition, because this is one type which presents with uh, symptoms. So that is what we are going to focus on today. So the first type, which we are calling sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease, there is homozygous inheritance of HBSS. It is symptomatic. So in sickle cell disease, there is inheritance of two defective genes of hemoglobin S. S is standing for a sickle cell defective hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin. So this individual is going to inherit two defective hemoglobin. Therefore, it is. Uh, abbreviated as HBSS. In an actual sense, any individual should have HBA, meaning this person should have adult hemoglobin. But an individual with sickle cell anemia is going to inherit, uh, is going to inherit HBS, uh, meaning they will inherit uh, both defective genes of sickle cell for the condition to be symptomatic or to be seen in this individual that so that's all about the first type of sickle cell and the second type that we can look at is called sickle cell trait so sickle cell trait there is heterozygous inheritance of hbs 
uh, and it is asymptomatic meaning in this uh, sickle cell trait this individual cannot show symptoms the reason is because they have only inherited one defective uh, hemoglobin meaning it is going to be abbreviated as hbas meaning there is an adult hemoglobin and one defective sickle cell hemoglobin so this patient cannot show symptoms unless if they marry another individual who has a defective uh, gene in their hemoglobin maybe they are they are also they have sickle cell trait and you also have sickle cell trait it means one of uh, out of the four children that you may have one of them is going to be uh, a sickler so basically that is uh, that that is what we can cause sickle cell trait it is heterozygous meaning you are going to inherit a normal hemoglobin and the defective hemoglobin and then it is going to be abbreviated as hba Yes. So there is one sickle cell uh, defective hemoglobin and this one is asymptomatic. The last type that we can look at is called uh, sickle cell syndrome. So sickle cell syndrome, it is associated with presence of HBS uh, or HBC or HBD. So sickle cell trait is, uh, sickle cell syndrome rather, it is associated with presence of HBS uh, HB, HBD uh, or HBC. So this individual can have um, hemoglobin having a defective gene of sickle cell and another uh, hemoglobin D or a hemoglobin C. So it can be abbreviated as HBSCC or HBSCD, meaning this is this individual has sickle cell syndrome. Meaning if you marry again in this condition, this is. Um, this is asymptomatic this is asymptomatic but if you marry an individual who who is uh, uh, who has sickle cell trait you might end up having a child who is a sickler so basically those are the three types of uh, sickle cell disorders and uh, like i said sickle cell would depend on the presence of a defective sickle cell uh, hemoglobin so we are going to continue looking at sickle cell anemia because that is our main focus for this evening. Okay, now we are going to move on to the pathophysiology of sickle cell. So on the pathophysiology of sickle cell, you, you notice that um, the, the hemoglobin A, so you start with the hemoglobin A consists of four molecules of heme folded in one molecule of globin. So the hemoglobin A consists of four molecules of heme folded in one molecule of globin, meaning there is a globin molecule on the middle and there are four heme molecules surrounding that one globin molecule. And each glob uh, globulin molecule consists of two alpha and two beta chains. So each, uh, each globulin molecule consists of two alpha and two beta chains of, uh, of molecules, meaning this is how a normal or adult hemoglobin should look like. So how, that's how they should do, look like. However, due to presence of a sickle cell defective gene, the properties of hemoglobin is changed permanently so however even though the, that, that is the standard now how does the uh, sickle cell come in so sickle cell come in because there's a presence of a sickle cell defective hemoglobin changing the property of that hemoglobin such that when the hemoglobin is the, when the hemoglobin s is subjected to low oxygen tension the abnormal beta chains contracts pining up together within the red blood cells this distorts the shape of the red blood cells and these cells they will now assume a sickle shape becoming rigid clamping together and forming masses of red blood cells therefore the mass of uh, the masses they block the blood flow so when it comes to pathophysiology of, of sickle cell, talk about the normal hemoglobin, then after that talk about a defective gene being present. When it's caught and or subjected to low oxygen tension, the abnormal beta chain, they contract together, piling up and resulting in two clotting of blood. Okay, now we can continue from there.
continue from there when they power up together it results into distorting now the shape of the red blood cells and they now uh, the, these cells will now assume a sickle shape that's where the condition came from they will assume a sickle shape becoming rigid clamping together and uh, forming masses of blood which ends up now blocking even the flow of blood so we can continue if we are writing this will further lead to cycling of uh, other red blood cells with more obstruction of uh, of blood vessels and ischemia of the affected tissue repeated episodes of ischemia will lead to progressive damage of the affected tissue resulting into infection so the cells usually may return in their normal shape after the low oxygen conditions are removed and proper oxygenation occurs so up to that point we are saying other red blood cells are going to assume the sickle shape then when this happens there are going to be repeated episodes of of ischemia resulting into death of uh, of uh, of body tissue which is infection now when uh, normal conditions resumes whereby oxygen supply is now maintained or restored in the body you realize that uh, sickle cell patient they tend to have a problem when it's very cold because it can result into clotting of uh, blood but when let's say they are exposed to a warm environment and then oxygen levels is maintained or restored it means the sickle shell uh, shaped red blood cells are going to return to their normal normal shape and then even oxygen will be maintained uh, or restored to its normal to its normal supply we can proceed so so the repeated cycling of the cell lead to permanent distortion of the cell structure adopting a characteristic crescent or circled shape due to cell membrane damage the cells therefore become more fragile and easily hemolyzed or broken down the lifespan also reduces from 120 days to less than 30 days. The sickle shaped cells increase the viscosity of blood or the thickness of blood in other words, thereby increasing the chances of infection causing further cycling of cells. Furthermore, the reduced lifespan of red blood cells causes hemolytic anemia. The patient also experiences periodic uh, episodes of cellular cycling called saying uh, the reduced lifespan of red blood cells they, they cause what hemolytic anemia. So the patient may also ex uh, the patient will further ex uh, experience excuse periodic episodes of cellular cycling uh, cycling called crises and these crises are characterized by high fever and also body pains so generalized body pains are going to be experienced because of uh, of presence of CCOD cells so when it comes to explaining the pathophysiology that's where you end so just explain uh, the normal hemoglobin so we are saying the normal hemoglobin should have should be hba with two beta chain and two uh, alpha chains and then in the presence of in in case of sickle cell anemia there's going to be hbs so because there's a defective hemoglobin amongst the normal hemoglobin which is hbss it is going to result into increased uh, viscosity or or clamping together of red blood cells such that it leads to obstruction of flow which can cause to infect which can cause infection and it can also result into into the masses uh, i mean the the the, the blood uh, the red blood cells come clamping together and then forming masses apart from that we are saying uh when there is um, Mm, when there is reduced oxygen levels it increases the rate at which these red blood cells clump together impairing uh, circulation to the rest of the body and we are saying because the, the these red blood cells are fragile and uh, sickle shaped their lifespan reduces from 120 to 
30 days meaning there is increased breakdown of red blood cells this patient is going to be losing a lot of red blood cells uh, within a shortest period of time and this is an individual who has defective red blood cells meaning whenever this happens this patient is going to be experiencing severe uh, clinical manifestations okay then apart from that we are saying because there is reduced red blood cell lifespan it causes or it might lead to hemolytic anemia and because of uh, this also the patient might experience uh, crisis and this crisis we are saying the the patient is going to have high or raised body temperature and they are going to be in severe severe body pains so that is where you end when you are explaining the pathophysiology of sickle cell okay so having defined the sickle cell looking at the types of sickle cell and also talking about um, how a normal hemoglobin should look like we can now move on to the signs and symptoms of sickle cell anemia or the clinical manifestations of sickle cell anemia the first the first symptom we can talk of is um, uh, attacks of abdominal pains due to tissue ischemia so the patient might experience severe abdominal pain due to tissue ischemia because there is reduced oxygen supply to the abdominal tissue the next uh, clinical manifestation is bone pain especially where there are joints and this is also due to ischemia the other symptom is uh, breathlessness due to cardiopulmonary involvement so the patient they might feel like they are having difficulties in breath because the cardiopulmonary system is involved remember the viscosity of blood has increased and everything else meaning the cardiopulmonary system is going to have a challenge to pump that excess blood or the increased viscosity blood to the rest of the body the other clinical manifestation is that there is delayed growth so delayed growth and also reaching puberty because energy demands of the bone marrow for, for red blood cell production compete with the demand of a growing baby. So remember this is a defective, this is a bone marrow which is producing immature or defective red blood cells at a higher rate. Therefore the, the bone marrow is going to be using a lot of energy in production of uh, other red blood cells in an effort to say maybe we'll produce normal red blood cells this time. So the bone marrow will be using a lot of energy as compared to the other energy that is needed for the growth of the, the individual's body. The other clinical manifestation is fatigue which is due to hypoxia, which is due to tissue hypoxia. And then the other clinical manifestation is fever. So it's fever and fever, this is due to the inflammatory reaction caused by tissue infection. The patient may also experience jaundice. Jaundice is due to increased levels of bilirubin as a result of increased hemolysis of red blood cells. Remember the lifespan of red, red blood cells has been reduced from 120 days to less than 30 days, meaning there will be increased breakdown of these red blood cells and this patient might experience jaundice. There is rapid heart rate as a compensatory mechanism to hypoxia. So rapid the heart rate, this, is, this comes in as a compensatory uh, mechanism to hypoxia because the, the heart will try to be pumping uh, at a faster rate to, so that it counteracts the, the reduced uh, blood supply to body tissues. Okay, then uh, other symptoms uh, that, you, that the patient might experience are chest pains. So chest pains, this is basically due to pulmonary infarction or cardiac ischemia. So pulmonary infarction can result in two chest pain. And then the other clinical manifestation is restlessness, especially during crisis uh, due to pain. So restlessness is, uh, occurs mainly when there's a crisis and this is because the patient experiences severe, severe pain. So I've talked of more than five clinical manifestations of uh, sickle cell anemia. So the, these are the things that you may see in a patient who has sickle cell anemia. Now we can move on to the type of crisis. So it is very important that you know these types of crisis 
because it will help you on how you are going to manage this patient. Even if you are taught to nurse manage this patient, make sure you go back to your scenario and check through which type of a crisis has been mentioned and make sure you mention that in your management. Even if it's a nursing care plan, make sure you come, with, come up with problems that are more specific to a type of crisis that the patient is facing. So we are going to start with the first type and the first type that we are going to look at is hemolytic crisis. So hemolytic crisis, this is due to presence of hemoglobin S which is fragile and easily hemolyzed. So severe hemolysis will further lead to low oxygen carrying capacity which will further lead to low oxygen tension thereby precipitating a crisis. So basically that's how hemolytic crisis comes about. This is because the red blood cells are being broken down at a faster, faster rate. And uh, because the red blood cells are being broken down at a faster rate, the oxygen carrying capacity of the remaining red blood cells uh, reduces. And because there is this reduction in oxygen carrying capacity, uh, it results in too low tension. And this low oxygen tension causes a crisis, somebody experiencing a crisis, which we said it is manifested with fever and also body pains. Make sure you manage the patient, the pain of the patient in your immediate care. Start with the resuscitative measure, make sure you mention pain management and other things. Those are the cardinal things to mention when you are managing a patient with the sickle cell. Okay, the next uh, crisis that we can look at is called th thromboembolytic crisis or it is also called vaso-occlusive crisis. So thromboembolytic crisis or vaso-occlusive crisis is one and the same. And this is mainly due to presence of hemoglobin S. Because, the, because of the presence of hemoglobin S, it results in two, a change in the structure of the red blood cells increasing viscosity of blood. This further causes obstruction of the blood vessels due to thrombosis. This will, will later lead to low oxygen tension in the area distal to the point of occlusion, thereby causing a crisis which may also cause ulcer formation and also a stroke. So thromboembolytic is because the viscosity of red blood cells has increased. So this causes obstruction of the blood vessels and this, uh, this is mainly due to thrombosis because the viscosity of blood has increased and then this precipitates or causes a crisis. On to other types. We can move on to other types. The third type that we can look at is called spleen, uh, spleen sequestration crisis. So spleen sequestration crisis. This is basically due to large amounts of blood that is trapped in the spleen. And this further causes circulatory collapse in general circulation which may lead to low oxygen levels. So the spleen uh, is trapped. This is because remember the spleen is producing uh, uh, or the, the bone marrow is producing defective red blood cells. And we have mentioned to say these red blood cells, they result into increased viscosity and uh, they tend to attach to each other. So these red blood cells are going to be trapped in the spleen. And once this occurs, remember the spleen also is supposed to produce red blood cells or blood cells in general. So when they are trapped in the, in the spleen, it results into a circulatory collapse in general circulation, meaning circulatory or supply to the rest of the body is impaired. And this results into reduced oxygen levels in the body. And this may now cause a crisis, meaning this patient might experience generalized body pains, which comes due to reduced supply of blood to body tissue. The last type that we can look at is called aplastic crisis. So aplastic crisis, uh, this is uh, due to the bone marrow, which is unable to produce enough red blood cells. This further results in too low oxygen tension due to inadequate red blood cells, which further causes a crisis. So in a plastic crisis, we are talking about the bone marrow itself. 
the bone marrow is supposed to produce uh, red blood cells but in a case where the bone marrow is producing defective or defected red blood cell and in this case the red blood cells have an S hemoglobin meaning the production will be reduced because the bone marrow is not meant to produce abnormal red blood cells so because there is reduction in production of red blood cells by the hemoglobin um, by the bone marrow it causes uh, reduced oxygen supply in the body causing low oxygen tension because there is reduced red blood cell volume in the body and this further causes a crisis so those are the four types of crisis uh, that we can look at so even when it comes to treatment you should do be focusing on trying to eliminate the type of crisis that this patient is experiencing that way you can manage a sickler faster and effectively so some predisposing factors that can make this individual go into a crisis are things such as dehydration so you ensure that this patient should be taking in a lot of fluids because if the patient is dehydrated it means the viscosity or the thickness of blood increases further predisposing this patient to a crisis uh, infections should be prevented because infections might raise the body temperature and then they, they might be increased hemolysis of red blood cells predisposing the patient to a crisis strenuous exercises so strenuous exercises might result into the s hemoglobin um, clamping together or uh, yeah clamping together making a sickle shaped red blood cells meaning the oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cells when they are sickled it reduces and it predisposes the patient to a crisis severe trauma such as maybe injury where the patient loses a lot of blood can cause someone to experience a crisis exposure to cold might cause the red blood cells go into a sickle shaped uh, formed meaning oxygen carrying capacity is impaired and their effectiveness is reduced uh, moving to higher altitudes may reduce oxygen uh, concentration and may make someone go into a crisis meaning these individuals shouldn't be going to higher altitudes. It's safer to fly the aeroplane because in the plane, the oxygen is, is maintained by climbing trees, or climbing mountains. If it, that's their passion, they need to stop because uh, the higher you go, the less oxygen that is up there. Okay. So when it comes to management of, uh, uh, of sickle cell anemia, we can talk of it from the point of... Uh, nursing management this is because there, there will be no uh, specific medication that you are going to give uh, in, in in sickle cell anemia but mainly antibiotics uh, might be given such as uh, cristapen penicillin one to two mega units qid for five to seven days if there is presence of infection due to hypoxia oxygen at least five liters per minute is uh, Given. You can give analgesic such as pethidine because this patient is in severe pain, about 50 to 100 milligrams BD for about 3 to about 7 days or for 3 days in short. You can also give folic acid about 5 milligrams once daily for about 14 days. And in terms of uh, severe cases, you can do also do a blood transfusion. A non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug such as aspirin can be given. You can even give a low dose aspirin, 75 milligrams, so that the, the, the thickness of uh, red blood cells or the viscosity is reduced because aspirin at low dose it acts as a blood thin. And then the most cardinal things are fluids. But when it comes to n management of uh, sickle cell anemia, it is may it may be asked in terms of uh, nursing management because this is uh, cardinal because there is no specific treatment. That's why the the focus shifts to nursing management. So in terms of nursing management, you are going to manage this condition using emergency interventions. So after you write your your M's, your four M's, you can now move on to them. Uh, to writing the heading 
resuscitation of the patient then you start with the airway after the airway you go to breathing from breathing you go to circulation and circulation mostly talk about fluids they are very very much important you should give at least the patient 1000 mils of less than normal saline within 24 hours so fluids become very cardinal in management of sickle cell so talk about fluids after that go to the heading uh, pain management talk about pain management because people patients with sickle cell they experience severe severe pain so talk about pain management then after that that's when you can bring in headings from a profanum you can bring in uh, in fact you can bring in psychological care then you bring in observation talk about um, uh, other headings such as nutrition hygiene and the elimination rest is also important in in sickle cell because it promotes healing this is a patient who has reduced red blood cells and the carrying capacity is reduced so when they rest it helps uh, the body to utilize the little amount of uh, red blood cells it has effectively okay so basically those are the things you can talk about uh, in the management of sickle cell and in your IEC you can talk about educating the patient about the condition so that you create awareness and also prevention of recurrent crisis or explain the need to be taking the medication in order to promote compliance and also recovery also in your IEC you can talk about educating the patient about the predisposing factor so that you prevent further crisis also talk about the need to take uh, a balanced diet uh, in order to boost the immune system and also to promote red blood cell formation so you can talk about all those points in your IEC as you are giving IEC. Also educate the patient about the need to, for, for, for review dates so that uh, the progress is monitored to ensure full recovery. You can also advise the patient to ensure that he or she is dewormed at least uh, twice a year. Some of you have never been dewormed since you were born and then you are wondering why your, ha your appetite is, is, is on the roof thinking uh, at you know me i'm a guy i need to eat a lot meanwhile it's just <laughs> the presence of the worms so yeah you you talk about deworming because the worm, uh, worms may reduce the blood levels of this individual so you may all give all those iec to the patient and advise them accordingly thank you uh, so much for taking time to to go through this tutorial video uh, make sure you read your notes, you study hard, uh, read questions and revise. Thank you so much.